Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at another refresh... Wait, that's not the name, where is it? There it is! Uh, yeah, another refresh X299 uh, motherboard from Gigabyte, this time the X299X Designare 10G. Um, and before we get into this, full disclosure, Gigabyte has actually sent one of these to me for review, so I have one for free. Um, so, yeah, with that out of the way, uh, let's get into this PCB breakdown. So, the pictures are actually mine for this one. But anyway, so the highlight feature of this motherboard is the 10G right here, like this. Um, and, and you might be like, but Buildzoid, we've seen 10G on plenty of other motherboards. Well, yes, that's true, but you've not seen 10G that looks like this. See, this isn't the... Now, normally you have that sort of metal... Um, like, you have that chip with the metal cover, and that's the 10G on most boards, and that's in a Quantia chip. That's a single 10 gig LAN. This right here is dual 10 gig from Intel. That chip right th th like this chip right here is an ELX uh, 550 uh, from Intel. So you do get actually two 10 gig ports and uh, yeah, well, LAN by Intel. It's pretty much server grade LAN built directly into your motherboard. Um, actually not even pretty much, like it's literally server grade LAN built directly into your motherboard. So if for some reason you wanted this on like an add-in card or something, well with this board you don't waste PCIe slots um, to get that uh, LAN controller onto the motherboard, so that's really, really cool. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where the, the board gets its name from, though it's definitely not the only board with 10 gig. It is, I think, well, for, from Gigabyte, actually, this is the first 10, dual 10 gig Intel board that you can buy from Gigabyte, but they're also, they also have other motherboards that will be coming out with the, the dual 10 gig control, like this exact controller, um, so, yeah, you know, and we will cover those in, in future PCB breakdowns, but this is the, the first from Gigabyte. I'm not aware of any other board vendors doing something like this yet. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool for some people because I have heard some people say that they'd really like a motherboard, you know, with integrated 10 gig from Intel. So, well, here here is one. Um, so anyway, um, let's move on to things that I under actually like really care about because, uh, you know, it's... Like, I can understand why having two 10 gig ports is better than having one, because two is more than one, but <laughs> I don't really do serious networking, so, like, my, uh, a lot of my experience with, like, network controllers is kind of like, well, I personally never had great experience with Realtek, but Realtek doesn't, like, you don't see Realtek 10 gig anyway, so that's not relevant, um, but, uh, yeah, like, I've heard from people that they do prefer, you know, 10, like they prefer their Intel controllers basically everywhere and that uh, included for for 10G. So uh, let's move on to things that I do understand and do care about uh, that aren't 10 gig land because the thing is I don't really care about this since I don't even have 10 gig networking at home. Um, I don't really use the network at home for anything. It's like my phone is on Wi-Fi and my desktop's on net like LAN. That's great. You know, yeah. L lots of high speed uh, file transfer going on right there. <laughs> which is for a couple photos here and there. Anyway, so let's move on to things that I do care about. We do have dual BIOS on this motherboard. Um, oh, and, and they've, they've, they've jammed both of the BIOS chips right here, which is fine, but these are the BIOS LEDs, and it's just like, okay, so not only will you not be able to tell which BIOS chip is active based on, like, the position of, like, like, at a glance, you won't be able to tell which BIOS chip is active. You'll have to actually, like, look at the board and figure out if it's this LED or that LED that's lighting up. Not only that, if you have, you know, like, one GPU, two GPU, uh, you're not going to see that. Or more like if you have a three-slot car, uh, if you have a three-slot GPU and then another three-slot, yeah, good luck seeing the, the, the LED indicator. Um, since this is a dual BIOS board from Gigabyte, we also have a BIOS switch. Um, to choose which BIOS chip you're on, and a single BIOS mode switch so you can disable the automatic dual BIOS functionality because, well, it kind of, it gets in the way if you're doing any serious overclocking. So that's kind of, so, so that's down here and that's definitely nice to have. There's also a power button uh, in the least convenient location possible. Like, you, you put a sound card in this and you're not going to be able to press that. Or really, like, uh, well, no, capture, well, depends on the capture card. Some actually have, like, they, they fully take up the slot. Some are basically just a PCB with some chips on it, uh, chips on them. So with, with one of those, it's not really a problem because it doesn't really take up any space. But with, with some thicker PCIe cards, yeah, you're, you're not getting to press that power button. Then we have a, re uh, reset button. I assume a clear CMOS and, uh, no, that is a reset. No, I said it was reset right there. 
That's the USB port, so that's got to be a... Yeah, it says right there, CMOS switch. So that's the clear CMOS. So I was right. And of course, in between the two, we have the postcode in of like the, the location where it's most likely to get covered up by a GPU. Though, admittedly, multi-GPU setups are very dead these days, so you'd probably... Well, no, a three-slot GPU could end up being a problem. Right, like if you got one of the really thick cards, that, that could actually <laughs> still end up covering up the postcode pretty well. So, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of it being down here, but at the same time, it's like, well... Not really much space to do anything in this area of the board, especially because it is actually EATX, like, and, you know, it's basically, I do believe most of that's because of how much space the 10 gig uh, LAN connectors take up, and then the 10 gig chip itself, um, yeah, they, they've kind of pushed everything that way. So the end result is, that, like, your dim slots are aligned with, with the actual ATX screw, like, screw hole right there. And then, well, yeah, the, the board is already very wide and gigabyte, like, I can understand that they didn't make it any wider because, yeah, it, like, it causes, uh, you basically run into cases with, like, recessed motherboard trays where it's just like, yeah, if the board gets any wider, it's not going to fit anymore. So, yeah, that's, and already this, this could be an issue with some cases with just how wide this is as is. Um, anyway, we also get a extra six pin power connector for the PCIe slots. Um, and though I wonder if they could have put the postcode maybe like, well, no, there's that USB thing. And it doesn't make sense to put it here because if you have like an air cooler, you're never going to see it. So yeah, <laughs> there's really not a good place on this motherboard to put that postcode, which is kind of unfortunate. So yeah, board also comes with Wi-Fi, um, which is this card right here. So yep. Um, and I think that covers all of the sort of general features on this that I wanted to cover. Oh, wait, I forgot. Uh, it has... The new Q Flash Plus. So there's no Q Flash button on this thing. So uh, yeah, uh, it's supposed to be able to recover your BIOS if it's corrupted automatically. Um, and I say automatically because automatic systems don't work and magic isn't real. So, you know, hand in hand right there. <laughs> automatically it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, um, that's kind of kind of the thing is like, I'm not really a fan of having a automatic BIOS like cut flash reco like flash recovering system that that just sounds like it's never ever actually going to be successful so yeah not really a fan of that really wish they had a button in the rear io especially because it's not like this rear io is particularly full anyway because these are just two two uh two tall um two ports tall usb ports right here so they could have just had like a header somewhere for a bios button that would go you know integrate into the io cover and uh yeah and they could have also done that for clear CMOS as well. Like they do, they do have the the antennas of the Wi-Fi actually go into the I/O cover, but there's still plenty of space in there. Like two little buttons would definitely have a fit, and it's just like I really don't get why they didn't do that. But yeah, they didn't do that. Um, which, admittedly, I don't think I've ever seen a rear I/O button that was on a on an actual header like that. You'd have to plug it in. So I guess it's just not a thing that motherboard vendors do. So nobody thought of that. It's like, oh well, we ran out of space, no buttons. Um, anyway, um, other neat. Oh, and looking over my notes, I noticed one other neat feature. So this right here is Dual Thunderbolt three. So this board actually does have uh, two Thunderbolt three ports. There's also the display uh, display inputs right here for that, and uh, yeah, that's that's Intel Thunderbolt three. I, yeah, Intel makes yeah. I have that right. I don't really care about really high speed interfaces. Like at least with LAN, it's like well, it's LAN, so I can uh, kind of understand that. But then it's just like freaking Thunderbolt is just like that's that Apple thing that's not compatible <laughs> that needs dongles, and that's where my interest ends. Um, so yeah, but this has dual Thunderbolt 3 ports as well. So, you know, if you want to use that, that that's available as well. So in terms of actual sort of, uh, well, you know, uh, workstation type features, this has a lot of them, um, right? Because you have the Thunderbolt 3 and the, the 10 gig as well. Um, and there's a Wi-Fi 6 card, which, you know, I like, I really don't know why you'd buy a board with dual 10 gig and then use the Wi-Fi. Like, I really don't get that, but... Um, it is available if you need to use it. Um, other than that, you do get three M.2 slots. Um, so that's these three. Uh, this right here, as you can clearly see, does not have a connector for the M.2. So that, that's not, uh, yeah, that, that's not uh, soldered on the board. But the board does come with a four M.2 slot, uh, four M.2 drive expansion card. 
So yeah, if you want even more drives, like it has the option, like it comes with an option for that. So, but that is an add-in card. They're not built in directly into the board. And I assume that's done because there's just not enough PCIe. Like, I'm assuming like this one and this one are probably off of the chipset. So then it's just like, well, if you want, like if they had more of them going off of the CPU socket, then it's just like you'd be dis disabling PCIe slots anyway. So at that point, it's just like, well, you might as well just have it as an expansion card because it's not like you're going to get those lanes back. So yeah, anyway, with that out of the way, let's talk about the VRM. Yay, finally something I... Wait, where's the IR3? Oh, there it is. Just realized that you can't see the controller. Um, so this right here is our... Wait, really? Interesting. Um, wait, am I missing something? No, because that's the input filtering choke. That's the memory... That's memory input filtering. That's the memory VRM. Yeah, no, I'm not missing anything. It's just... There's 13 of them, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yes. Okay. So this... Hop, there. So this right here is uh, VCCSA. Then all of this is VCC in. I'm not going to get into... Well, am I? No, I don't want to. I don't feel like getting into that. VCC in. Basically, uh, X299 CPUs don't have... Like, they don't get fed vCore. They get fed VCC in, which is like 1.8 volts or higher. Uh, that voltage is then converted by a voltage regulator built directly into the CPU down to the actual vCore voltage and the vMesh voltage and, I th and like a system agent rail and a couple other... Like, the, I think there might be more. I think... No, it's only those three. I can't remember how many it converts into, but it converts into like all of the actual low voltages that the CPU needs. The reason why Intel does this is this is far more efficient into like this is a far more efficient power delivery method than just ramming vCore into the CPU from from a vCore VRM because you know if you're running several well basically you significantly reduce the amount of current that the the vCore like the VRM of the motherboard has to produce so there's less power loss in the socket and the power plane and just everywhere like you know need to supply so much current and then the CPU can do the voltage conversion itself and the fully integrated uh, the, well it's not fully integrated the integrated voltage regulator is actually much better than vol at voltage regulation than your external voltage regulators are so um, there's also a benefits from that where it's just like yeah and voltage regulation is actually better. So anyway, th this is our VCC in. It's a 12 phase. Unfortunately, the uh, X299 platform is not compatible with, more, well, more like the XDPE 132G5C is not compatible with the X299 platform. So the controller that Gigabyte is using is the IR35201, which of course does not support a 12 phase output. So here it is running as a six plus one. That plus one, of course, is your VCCSA. Um, yeah, that rail is external for no apparent reason, uh, not generated by the integrated voltage regulator. Um, and that six is then multiplied by two using all of these chips right here. So those are a bunch of IR3599s. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, the board was supposed to have a screw hole right here and they decided not to do that. Um, because ultimately the, the VRM heatsink covers up that screw hole and they didn't want to put a hole in the VRM heatsink where the screw would have to go. But the board does come with a backplate and that backplate is, is still, still looks like there, there's, you know, like, like there was supposed to still be a hole. Though there, I guess there might be a chance that they're reusing this backplate for the master and maybe the master does have a hole. Um, I'm not sure. I've not seen the PCB of the master, so... Well, not this much of it anyway. Um, so these are all IR3599s. These are dumb, but they double, they quadruple. They don't do any current balancing or anything like that. But the IR35201 controller is actually capable of current balancing straight through them. So that's really not like a concern with this. So the VRM is like the controller can still distinguish between all 12 of the phases. The only downside to using the IR3599s is that they do add a little bit of delay to your PWM signals, which is anywhere from like five nanoseconds from the on the fastest transitions to the 25 nanoseconds on the slowest transitions. Um, the end result of that is that you do take a, like there is a slight hit to transient response performance, but there are ways to work around that in both like the design of the output filter for the VRM. So, well, it's not all of these because some of these are for the VCCSA, which actually, if we look at the back of the board, okay, it's these two, because that's our VCCA. Like you can just about make out the VCCSA power plane right there. 
right? So that's that. So yeah, but the design of the sort of output filter, so what capacitors are being used and um, how they're laid out can actually, you know, you can use that to mitigate for the, uh, the del well, the disadvantage that the doublers give you to, your, to the transient response performance. Um, and then also there's like firmware optimizations that you can do to minimize the impact. So that's kind of the thing is just like, uh, the fact that the motherboard uses doublers does not automatically mean the transient response sucks. It just means it might be not as good as it could be. Okay, so that's kind of that. So I'm not going to pass. And the other thing to to consider is that with X299, the integrated voltage regulator really does all of the very difficult like voltage regulation work. So the the actual VCC NVRM being slightly less good at uh, transient response is less of a concern because it's not doing all of the really difficult. Like it's not dealing with the. Uh, really, like the 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 integrated voltage regulator is the one dealing with all of the really large currents. The VCCN is just kind of like it's providing less current and therefore has also less uh, big transients uh, being applied to it because it's outputting a higher voltage. So yeah, like the the integrated voltage regulator is really really cool. Um, so anyway. But that's the control scheme of this VRM. So we basically get a like an old-fashioned 12 phase. Though funnily enough, very long ago there was a controller from I think UPI Semiconductor that was a 12 phase, and it was used on like a couple GPUs and never again. So that that existed as well. But uh, yeah, so for until the XDP 132 G5C came out, like this is the only way you could get a 12 phase. So this is a 12 phase. And for the power stages, Gigabyte is using the TDA 21472s, which are free, uh, 21472s, which are 70 amp smart power stages. And these are freaking awesome. So smart power stages are smart because unlike other power stages, they integrate a more accurate current monitoring system. Like some power stages don't integrate current monitoring at all. It's an optional feature. But these integrate uh, very accurate current monitoring, temperature monitoring, overcurrent protection, over temperature protection, some I, and other protections that I'm not going to try to name because I don't actually remember exactly what they are and I'm probably going to get them wrong. Um, also because I don't really care about them. But because they have all of these built-in protections, they're called smart power stages because with other power stages, you'd have to like add extra circuitry into your design to provide the various pr protections or you'd have to have a controller that has options to support those protections um, with these well the protection just comes from the power like the the component itself so that's really cool the other thing that's cool about smart power stages is that well that 70 amp current rating they get that by being insanely efficient and they are a like basically if you're building a 12 fight well until i'm well i've not seen a a data sheet for the 90 amp power stages yet but um these are definitely top like uh, until very recently, these are as good as it gets for, for power stages on motherboards. So, yeah. And, and now we're starting to see, like, even higher current ha handling capacity rated parts. The thing is, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be, like, a huge increase in power efficiency. It might just be like, oh, yeah, we can handle way more heat dissipation. So it's just like, there's your cu high current rating. Because that's always, like, th that's a really funny thing is if you compare, like, say, low side MOSFETs, you'll often find uh, MOSFETs which have a relatively high RDS on, but a ridiculous current rating because it's like, oh, it's a thermally optimized package that can just dissipate like 30 watts of heat. And it's just like, yeah, but I'm not actually going to want like, that's not useful. <laughs> it's not going to be efficient. Sure, it can handle 100 amps if you have a 30 watt heat sink on your one MOSFET. Doesn't make it a 100 amp MOSFET. But I think with the power stages that like the 90 amp parts probably are like, they won't be doing that just because you couldn't like with power stages there's a bit more stat like with power stages it wouldn't make sense to have a rating like that too much but it is also true that like 70 amp rated parts do have a much higher heat dissipation than say 40 amp rated parts like the max heat output of a 70 amp part is higher than of a 40 amp part or a 30 amp part so it, it does happen but yeah so like the efficiency gain from a 90 amp smart power stage probably isn't going to be that massive it's not going to be like the difference between a 40 amp power stage and a 70 amp power stage, which is actually pretty significant because you can get 40 like you can get 40s that top out at like 92 ish percent or 92 point something percent. These top out at 
over 94 point something for like over 94 percent so anyway let's talk about the actual efficiency of this vrm as relevant to the cpus that you could actually put into this socket um so at 1.8 volts output because that's what you know sky like uh sky like x and cascade like x the cpus run on uh motherboard does not support kb like x um which is like I know KB Like X is kind of like it's dumb, okay? but I think Coffee Like X would be really cool because X299 does have a much more robust power delivery system. And yeah, like the, the I think like the 9900K can pull a lot of current. So I think that's like a CPU where you would like doing giving the 9900K the 7740X treatment, in my opinion, could lead to some chips that would actually like would be really, really cool. But yeah, Intel has decided that KB Like X was stupid and they're not doing that again. Um, and the board vendors have decided that KB Like X is stupid and their motherboards don't support it anymore. So yeah, that's something to watch. Like if you have, if you're considering buying an X299 motherboard for like competitive overclocking and you actually want KB Like X support, like you need to kind of watch, like avoid new boards because they don't support KB Like X anymore. Because no, like no, like. I guess it might even be discontinued at this point. Anyway, so 1.8 volts output, 600 kilohertz switching frequency, and also it's not. There's no point talking about the the VRM efficiency rel relative to like KB Lake X overclocking because KB Lake X doesn't pull any power. So, yeah, it's kind of that. Anyway, so 1.8 volts, 600 kilohertz, 5 volts drive voltage. Um, this VRM is gonna do the following efficiency figures. So at 200 amps output. Um, it's going to produce about 22 watts of heat, um, which, you know, that's for 360 watts going into the CPU. So that's a really great efficiency. It's higher than what you would see on like other, mo like when, when I do the usual VRM ratings, even with the TDA 21472s, I normally do rating like for Ryzen, I've been doing everything at 1.2 volts because it's kind of convenient as a, as a voltage to do the specs at, because that's a common voltage that data sheets come in. Um, 1.8 volts is the other one. And admittedly, when you're overclocking, you're probably not going to be at 1.2 volts, but it's just like, that's a convenient voltage to do the ratings at. And there's not too much difference between like 1.2 volts and 1.4. Um, but at 1.2 volts, the heat output is lower, which is why like at 1.8 volts, we're looking at 22 watts. If we were at 1.2, we'd be looking at, I think around 16, um, or maybe even, no, it'd be like 18 or something. 16 would be a bit low. I'm not sure right now. I'd have to actually like calculate it. So um, anyway, 200 amps, 22 watts. So, you know, for how much power this is pushing into the CPU, this is great. Then going up to 300 amps output, you're going to see about 30 watts of heat. So at this point, um, well, the, the thing is these, this VRM hits peak efficiency. These power stages hit peak efficiency at 20 amps output. So this is kind of where the VRM peaks and from, uh, actually no, it peaks at 240 amps output. So this is already a bit past the efficiency peak. Um, but this is also like, this is also like 540 Watts of power going into your CPU, at which point your CPU is going to be very, very hard to cool. So if you're looking at it from sort of like, you know, a day to day overclock that might be in that 400 to 500 Watt range, which is doable on, on water cooling. Um, well, maybe with the 18 core, you can get closer to 600 Watts, but, um, or, well, you might also with the 18 core be a bit more careful or you just don't want to run it that maxed out, right? Like tons of options. Like I think most people would probably land in the 400 to 500 Watt range. And this motherboard, you know, is kind of in the sweet spot in terms of, uh, hits kind of the sweet spot for efficiency in terms of that. Cause it does peak around that 240 amps output. Um, which also, if you're running like two volts VCC in instead of 1.8 volts, which is normal if you're overclocking, then that works out to around 480 watts. So pretty close to what the CPU might actually end up pulling. So yeah, kind of optimal in terms of efficiency here. Uh, there is one disadvantage compared to like having even more phases than this, and that's the heat density of a 12 phase is higher because it just has less surface area. But you know, there, there's there been some really great 12-phase motherboards on X299 already. We're talking like X299 Dark, the Z, uh, X299 OC Formula. So I'm really like, at this, like, it just, like, the only thing that it depends on right now is like what kind of heatsink Gigabyte has on this board. And I think I might actually do VRM. Th well, the thing is, I don't have the, I don't think I have a cooling, like, I don't have a K. Well, 
Yeah, no, because the thing is, my big water cooling loop is attached to a test bench, so there's just no way I'm cooling the a night like. There's no way I'm cooling an X299 system with an AIO. <laughs> like, there's just no way. That's not going to be enough to to really max out the CPU. So, anyway, um, 400 amps. Do I have four? No, I didn't bother specking 400 amps because 400 amps is this sort like sort of weird middle ground where it's like, well, you're not actually going to run that on water cooling anyway. And it's too low for liquid nitrogen. So on liquid nitrogen, you might peak around 500 amps. Um, and at this point, the VRM will produce about 64 watts of heat. This is definitely, like, you can deal with this if you have enough airflow. That's that's not a problem. Um, but need enough airflow. The other thing is, with liquid nitrogen, the VRM doesn't tend... Like, your, your benchmarks don't last that long. So kicking out 64 watts of heat for a couple seconds... Uh, you're going to be fine. You know, it would be a problem if you spent several, well, even like miserable motherboards with terrible heat sinks can often take like 30 plus minutes before they get up to like 100 plus degrees because the VRM heat sink is just very heavy or, you know, um, well, normally it's just because it's a very heavy block with no surface area, which is why it takes so long to get up to high temperatures, because it doesn't, it doesn't lose any heat, but it also has a lot of, like, it can also soak up a lot of thermal energy, so it's just like, yeah, it just keeps getting hotter and hotter forever. Um, and yeah, with, with LN2 overclocking, like, the longest benchmarks end in less than a minute. Like, well, I don't... I don't run the really long benchmarks. That's the thing. So I'm kind of biased, but like Cinebench lasts a couple seconds. So that's not a problem. Um, and actually for the really long benchmarks, you might actually run into more like CPU, like the, the actual keeping the CPU cool would actually also be a concern as well. Um, well, kind of a concern. Basically, this should be fine. And the thing is also Gigabyte really doesn't intend this motherboard for extreme overclocking anyway. So it's just kind of like, I, I don't think that... I, it's not a priority for this motherboard. It could do it. Like, it could definitely do it, but it's not a priority. Anyway, and just for fun, 700 amps output, the, this VRM would produce about 116 watts of heat, and uh, yeah, this is why this, this VRM is not being used on, like, uh, LGA3647 motherboards. <laughs> well, for, like, the the Xeon, um, what is it, 3175X? Yeah, for that one. So... Yeah, this VRM is like a really, in terms of power handling capability, this is a really great fit for, uh, you know, the, the kinds of CPUs that you get on X299. So very happy, like, yeah, I'm happy with it. You know, it's not insane overkill. It, it's, it's actually, it's a great fit. Like it hits peak efficiency roughly where most people will probably stop with their overclock, right? So yeah, <laughs> this is, uh, this is kind of optimal in my opinion. Um, anyway, VCCSA is just another TDA21472, which is, uh, well, excessive to say the least. Like, there's a lot of motherboards out there which have VCCSA just handled by a 40 amp power stage. Um, okay, not a lot. There's a couple boards that have it just done by a 40 amp power stage, some boards with a 50. Like, this is not a high current rail. If I remember correctly, the, the spec for that rail is like 10 amps or something like it's really like it's less power than your memory system can be so it's just like yeah no not not a priority a tda21472 for that is completely overkill now vccio is i assume this thing right here um, and i say i assume because uh well there's supposed to be a vccio rail somewhere in this area and the thing is is this is mirrored like this regulator right here is also right here and you do need like for ddr power you need your vddr which is this right and you need what like i well on a motherboard like this you'll have two of them because you want need one for each set of dim slots so that one's mirrored also over here that's vddr um and then you also have a vpp rail for the memory sticks um, and there's also a VTT DD, uh, yeah, VTT DDR rail, which is, I th might be this chip right here. Actually, I think it is exactly that chip. Like, there's basically a, uh, a linear regulator to generate the VTT DDR rail. Um, but anyway, then you have the VTPP rails, and so that's what I think those are. And there's supposed to be a VCCIO somewhere down here. And, well, the only thing that could possibly be that is this, um, and this looks like an IR3520, like, this is an IR35204. Yeah, that is in my notes. So I'm like, it looks like one. And then it's like, well, your notes say it's one. Why don't you read your bloody notes, idiot? Um, so yeah, that's a 35204. This is why I don't write scripts. I wouldn't end up, I'd actually not read it. <laughs> While like I could stare at it and not read the words on the page. 
Um, anyway, IR35204 running in a one plus zero for, actually it might be doing the chipset no there's another controller over there so it's not doing the chipset yeah so that's running as a zero one plus zero because the thing is like the vccsa is all the way up here so you know connecting that to the 35204 is stupid when you already have a free phase on the 35201 that can go up to like an eight plus like they could have actually done a 14 phase if they had more space right <laughs> like you need to cram the vr in between the dim slots and so that's that's why it's a 12 phase and not not even bigger um, or at least that's why I assume it's, it's, it's a 12 phase. Cause really there's no other practical reason to not do it. Like you could have added more phases. It's just like, it's not going to fit at some point. Um, okay. And on like the X299 extreme, they actually just move the whole VRM up so that they get more space above the dim slots. And yeah, but this board, no, we need to fit it between the dim slots. So this is your VCCIO. Um, these are, uh, reduced package size 4C06Ns. Um, which, funnily enough, are electrically superior to your standard 4C06N that you find in, like, the VDD, uh, VDDR rail. But the thing about the 4C06Ns in the reduced package size is that they're smaller and so worse thermally. They get more, they get hotter more easily. Um, but the thing is, VCCIO, it, like, this can, th this rail does actually some help a bit with, like, cache overclocking, but it also doesn't, like, it provides even less current than VCCIO, uh, I mean, VCCSA does. So this is a completely adequate adequate uh, way of handling it. It's just kind of unique because most motherboards do do just use a power stage for this. So that, well, if you used a power stage, your your VCC VCCIO rail would be, um, oops, didn't want to do that. Instead of being like this many, because you have a driver chip here and then you have the two uh, MOSFETs. Yeah, instead of having something like this, you just have a power stage. Done. Actually, you can get smaller power stages than that. A power stage. And it would be just one chip instead of three. So, yeah. But honestly, this is a perfectly way of, uh, perfectly good way of handling it. Interestingly enough, the VCCIO rail gets only multi-layer ceramic capacitors for its output filtering, which is kind of unique. Um, I mean, there's other motherboards that have done things like that. I've just not seen it on X299 yet. And, uh, yeah. So, that's VCCIO. We also have these rather interesting linear regulators right here. Um, and I find them interesting because... I'm not aware of there being that many different voltages that you can externally feed into X299 CPUs. So I'm really like, I really wonder if there's going to be like extra voltage options in the BIOS for this board. Um, so yeah, because the thing is, is like most of the board, like on the, like in my experience with EVGA boards, you basically have the VCC in, VCCSA, VCCIO. Those are like the three external voltages you get and that's it. Um, so I really wonder what these are for because that, that could actually be, because on X99 in the past, there was actually a bunch of like undocumented extra voltages that you could feed into X99 CPUs to get much better, uh, uh, uncore overclocking. Um, and those had to be generated by external regulators like this. So I'm wondering if, if maybe like, uh, well, yeah, I wonder what these are for as a result of that. Um. Because I don't think I've seen anything, noticed anything like this on any other boards. I might have seen it. I just might not have taken note that, hey, there's some strange regular chips sitting in the middle, right under the CPU socket. I wonder what those are for. Um, so, yeah, that kind of co covers the power delivery. Well, I didn't talk too much about the VDDR. It's the standard gigabyte VDDR rail. It's your three, you know, you've got your three 4C06Ns. You got a high side, you got a low side, then you got another low side. Um, there's a rich tech controller for this thing on the back of the board. Gigabyte's been copy pasting this memory power deliver like this memory VRM since Z170. If I think since Z170, don't quote me on that. It might have been Z270 when they designed it and then just kept using it everywhere. But uh, yeah, it's a single phase. It does a perfectly good jo job of powering your memory. Because um, if it didn't on the higher end boards, Gigabyte would actually you know make a better memory VRM. But they use this literally everywhere. Like <laughs> it's universal. <laughs> I've not seen a Gigabyte board. Um, like a recent gigabyte board that doesn't use this for the memory power. And it works fine. Like I've not really run into, okay, well, I've not really done like world record class over memory overclocks on gigabyte boards, but I've also not really run into any major, like, well, the, the thing is, is like, I have run into memory overclocking issues, but those are related to things like bad, the BIOS being weird, the motherboard, uh, the trace layout being weird, you know, that kind of thing not, oh, the memory VRM can't handle it. So yeah, because memory doesn't really pull that much power in the first place. So 
since I me me mentioned the memory layout being weird, um, well, daisy chains aren't weird, and actually, it's not so much weird, it's just, like, wrong. Because if, if you have, like, sometimes you get motherboards where it's just, like, no matter what you do, uh, they don't overclock. And it's normally because it's just, like, well, the PCB was just laid out wrong, and the memory just can't do it. Um... But anyway, so with the Refresh X299 boards, Gigabyte is actually changing the trace layout for all of their motherboards. Um, so in the past, the X299 boards were T-topology. Now they're all daisy chains, and you can cl see that clearly on the back here, because I've taken like a super close-up shot. Well, it's not super clear, but like you can see this trace goes there, goes there. That's a daisy chain. You can see how this trace goes from this slot to... Because the dim slots are like, this is one dim slot, this is the other dim slot, right? They're split like that. So you can see how it basically goes through what, the same pin on different memory slots. And you can see that here again. And with this one, nope. No, that one's unique. So some of them aren't the, like, well, I don't know what every single pin does. But you like if you see a couple pins where they just kind of connect like this, then you know you're looking at a daisy chain board. Um, because on a T-topology board, you'd see something that looks like like, instead of the, the trace just going through the first pin and then going to the next, uh, it would actually sort of avoid the first pin, go around, and then, like, right here it would split into two branches and go back. Um, so, yeah. Daisy Chain has a... Uh, ba well, Daisy Chain basically biases towards having only one dim per channel. So, you'd want to optimally, like, for optimal overclocking performance, you'd want to be running a memory configuration that's like this. Um, the reason why it doesn't like fully populated memory setups is because there's basically a timing difference between this dim slot and this dim slot, because the traces are, like, to one dim slot, the traces are effectively longer. Um, and the thing is, um, well, the... The, the impact this has kind of depends on the BIOS as well as the CPU and, and that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, with, with Daisy Chain, if you're on four DIMMs, you get a pretty nice memory overclocking advantage. Like, you can do very, like, you should be able to do much higher memory clocks. A T topology, um, the, the thing is, when you're running eight DIMMs or just two DIMMs per channel in general, your overclocking is kind of going to suffer for it because you have a lot of RAM. So at that point, it's not really so much a. Uh, like, at that point, it's just like, there's too many memory sticks, so uh, running a T-topology doesn't necessarily give you a huge advantage there anyway. So, yeah, I'm really interested, like, uh, to, to test out the memory overclocking on this board, because uh, I also have a different Gigabyte board that is a T-topology, so it's going to be interesting to do some comparisons. I've not gotten around to that yet. I, I hope I get around to that before, like, Threadripper shows up because that that would really suck because <laughs> then it's like no I just can't keep up with anything so yeah that's a daisy chain daisy chain topology um, Gigabyte claims that this can do up to forty three thirty three um, I I kind of doubt that's possible on a Skylake X CPU or at least on, on like an average Skylake X CPU as Skylake X CPUs like on most motherboards Skylake X has a hard time going over thirty six hundred. On great motherboards, it still has a hard time going over 4200. So it's just like, I think maybe Cascade Like X might be bringing us a, a better memory controller, which is where the uh, higher um, memory speed claims are coming from from the board vendors. There's also the fact that maybe they've optimized the memory layout some more, and it's just like, now the boards just clock higher because we've, we've had more time to, to design them um, since the initial launch. So that's... Uh, that's another possibility. So I'm definitely interested in trying out the memory overclocking. And then the last thing to talk about with this board is the heat sinks, right? I've covered the, yeah, covered absolutely everything. So let's talk about the heat sinks. So this board, um, I have pictures of the heat sinks, comes with this for the front of the board. So this obviously takes care of cooling the VCC in and VCC SA. You got a heat pipe so that the v so that the VCC in VRM can cook your chipset because the chipset doesn't need a heat sink. It's uh, basically a Z27. Like it can run with literally nothing on it. Like Z270 doesn't, well, the X299 chipset is basically the Z270 chipset. It doesn't run hot um, at all. So yeah, the, the heat sink here is really more for like cooling the VRM through the heat pipe than it is for cooling the actual chipset itself. And I guess actually, the, the funny thing is, if the VRM is hotter than the chipset, then the chipset will technically be sinking heat. Like, if this heat pipe 
at the end of the heat pipe, if the temperature is higher than the temperature of the chipset and the PCB under the chipset, the chipset will actually start sinking heat from the heat pipe into the PCB. So basically like the, the heat pipe acts as like a heat spreader for, for the whole board to equalize the temperature between the VRM and your chipset. Um, and also they have like this right here goes over the audio section of the board. It's, it doesn't heat sink the audio section. It just seems to be like more heat sinking for the VR. Well, it is just more heat sinking for the VRM. The thing about this is, is uh, that could cause some compatibility issues with certain GPUs, I feel like. Because there's some GPUs that will basically have a bit of PCB hanging down in, in that area of the, of, the, of the motherboard. And uh, yeah, that right there... Like, it could be tall enough that it stops you from installing certain cards in their PCIe slots. Like, we'll see if I run into that, but historically, like, on motherboards where Gigabyte doesn't have this metal heatsink essentially sitting over the audio section, the, when, when they just have a plastic cover, the plastic cover would be removable because certain GPUs would just not go into their PCIe slot if you had that plastic cover installed. So you'd be able to remove the plastic cover without removing the rest of it that covers the actual I.O. Um... So yeah, this is kind of brave in my opinion, because it's just like, this may very well be a compatibility hazard. And that's, yeah, that, that, that might not be the greatest thing ever, especially since it's like integrated into the heat pipe. So it's not like you can really get rid of it, right? Because you can't cut heat pipes. Like that completely destroys them. So, and, and bending heat pipes is also not exactly like a thing, is not a easy to do, th like is not a great thing to do either. From both the perspe per perspective performance and also the fact that you might actually crack the heat pipe while trying to bend it, and then you've just made the entire heat pipe completely useless. So, yeah. Anyway, the VRM heatsink, you know, the primary f fin stack for it is that, of course. Then there's a secondary fin stack over here, which also is shared by the uh, 10 gig LAN, uh, the, yeah, the 10 gig LAN chip from Intel, because that thing does produce quite a bit of heat. So that gets a little heatsink for itself that's integrated into this one right here. Um, so again, you might be in a situation where the VRM is actually cooking your LAN controller, which would, which would actually really suck if that happened. I'm, I'm generally against like unified cooling systems because it's just like, so if one thing gets really, really hot, it's going to roast everything else in the system as well. Great design right there. But it, I like, it really depends, right? Um, hopefully that never actually happens. Maybe the heat pipe just isn't that great at transferring the heat. Maybe the, maybe the, like the thing is, I, there's no actual like thermal, thermal paste between this, this little heat sink and the, and the main heat sink. So hopefully the thermal transfer between them isn't so great that, you know, if, if this ends up a couple degrees warmer than your 10 gig net, like than your networking controller, that the controller starts getting heated up by the, the VRM heat sink too much, right? There's obviously going to be some heat transfer, just not too much, like not so much that it actually becomes an issue but yeah I'm, I'm generally not a fan of having like various random like random things that produce heat coupled with bigger things that produce more heat through a heat sink it just seems like a great way to to cook like have one thing cook the other instead of just one roasting itself on its own um so Anyway, but of course, if the heatsink's big enough, like if the heatsink's big enough for everything, then that doesn't isn't a concern. So here's the front view of the heatsink. We've got a bunch of little fins. Uh, I'm kind of concerned about the fact that, like, like the thing is, these uh, this bend in the fin stack, like this right here in the fin stack, is done for assembly purposes, and same with this right here. It's just that that also acts like a airflow restrictor. So it's just like. That, that probably, like, I just, I'm just, like, th this looks like a really high airflow restriction fin stack, basically. Is what, so I'm kind of wondering how well, like, it might not be the best way to do a passive heatsink, is, is what I'm getting at. Um, it has a lot of surface area. It's just that, you know, if, if your surface area is so dense that it traps all of the hot air, it ain't doing any cooling anymore. Um... So that, that's kind of the only concern I have with this heatsink. But of course, this fin stack is much more open, right? Like you only have this right here. So all like th this, this fin stack is much more open. So this will hopefully, you know, compensate for any deficiencies in that fin stack. Or maybe this is already more than, nece more than necessary. It's not like this VRM produces a, a ton of heat unless you're really hammering it, right? Like again, you'd have to be on like liquid nitrogen before it becomes a massive problem. So 
yeah, you know, it, it might like there's a pretty good chance that even like the, the VR, like the, this heatsink system is actually completely overkill for how much heat this VRM will regularly produce under normal. Uh, well, not even normal workloads. Like I'm talking 500 watts going into the CPU. The VRM is probably going to be kicking out and, you know, less. Than, it's going to be kicking out less than 30 watts of heat because you're going to be pushing less than 300 amps out the VRM. So that's not going to be an issue. Um Right, like even really miserable plastic, uh, I mean, aluminum aesthetic, uh, you know, uh, aesthetic blocks. Um, no, fashion blocks. Yes, that's what I called them. Fashion blocks that, you know, some motherboards use for their heat sinking. Like even that should be be capable of, of cooling the VR, like cooling, you know, a little over 20 watts of heat. So um, maybe not spectacularly well, you know, it might get into close to 100 degrees, but that's totally fine for power components. Um so, yeah, th this should be perfectly fine. Anyway, um, here's the whole heatsink assembly, right? So there you can see the, the chipset part. And yeah, th this right here is like that right there just looks like a massive GPU compatibility. Well, actually, the whole thing just looks like a massive GPU compatibility hazard. Um, but that's the entire fin stack. I mean, entire heatsink for the board. And then we have this backplate, which acts as more heatsinking for the VRM. Um, and uh, yeah, like the, the back plate, it'll it'll sink some heat. I'm not entirely sure what it's made of. I don't really care. You have a really like, you know, a good enough heat sink system on the front of the board anyway, in my opinion. So this is just kind of like bonus cooling, you know, not ne not completely necessary. The other nice thing about this is it, it does add some rigidity to the board. So it doesn't flex so much if you're like installing it or something. And it protects you from like, like if you jam the motherboard into the case wrong or it slips or something, um, you're not gonna, cause you like, I've seen motherboards where it's like you have components on the back of the board get knocked off because somebody's installing it and they like, you know, run it over a standoff and it catches some little SMD component and just rips it off. Well, this protects the motherboard from that as well. So yeah, it's a nice, nice, uh, definitely a nice addition to have on a high-end board because it just makes the board more robust in general and acts as a bit of a cooling, uh, you know, acts as a bit of extra cooling as well. So yeah, that's the that's the uh, X299X Designary 10G from Gigabyte. Um, I like it. Well, I'm not really a fan of how, like, the thing is, the, <laughs> okay, no, there is one complaint I have. This does not have a lot of USB ports because... Um, like there's one USB port here and then there under that you have your, your Thunderbolt 3 port. Then there's another USB port over here. There's a Thunderbolt 3 under that. And then you got two USB ports over there and that's it. There's very few USB ports here. But the thing is, I assume most people buying this motherboard are probably like a lot of people might be buying it because it has a Thunderbolt 3. And in that case, you don't care about the, you know, kind of low number of rear IO USB ports. But for me, this is like, yeah, I would not put this in my daily system because Thunderbolt, like I, I just need USB ports. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need a high speed connection. I just need a lot of connections. Um, Though, you know, you can also just use, like, your two USB 3.0 front panel headers that you have. And they kept the color-coded front panel header. Yes! They're, they're doing some of the... I think they're doing it only for the Aorus boards. Since they're more gamery aesthetic, um, those are monochrome for the front panel connector. I much prefer the colorful one. It's much easier to tell, like, what you're supposed to plug into, in my opinion. So... Anyway, yeah, that's the Designary 10G. I think it's a, like, for what it's supposed to be, which is basically a workstation board, um, I think it's it does everything you'd really want from a from a workstation board. And it gives you some overclocking features as well. This is actually the same VRM, well, it gives you a lot of overclocking features. Um, this is actually the same VRM that you would get on the X299X Master. So, yeah, um, I like it. It's just, well, except for the USB port situation, but like the board is evidently not targeted at me, right? <laughs> like this is meant for people who, who want to have dual 10 gig, who want to have dual Thunderbolt 3, uh, you know, who, who care about things like that. Not people like me where it's just like, I need PCIe for my quad crossfire and I need USB ports. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Everything else, don't care. Um, so, yeah, um, that's kind of that. Anyway, so yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Gigabyte for sending the, the, the board over. 
And uh, what else was there? Right, like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with Actually Hardcore Overclocking, I do have a uh, Patreon where you can support me directly. There's a link to that down in the description below. And then if you don't like Patreon, there's also the AHOC Teespring store um, where, you know, there's shirts, there's stickers, there's posters, um, that kind of thing. If you'd like to buy those, those will help out with running the channel as well. So yeah, there's a link to that down in the description uh, too. And I didn't want to say as well again because I keep using as well. And well, I just said it twice more. So good job me. Anyway, I'll hit the stop button because that is the end of the video. And this one is rather long. Goodbye.